Merciful Father, I thank you for the opportunity of going into your word, looking into your word for strength, guidance, and instruction. I see you as the Father that you are. You're not only our God, but you're our Father. And I ask you by your might and your power that you will strengthen us and let us have your word to instruct us. I ask this in the blessed name of of your holy child, Yeshua, Jesus, amen and amen. Tonight we're going to go into the 103rd Psalm, and we're going to look at the aspects of Yahweh God as Father. Now I understand at a certain time of the year, we have this thing we call Father's Day, and it's almost obligatory to buy people buy men gifts. As a matter of fact, men that don't take care of their children, people walk around and, happy Father's Day, happy Father's Day. I don't do that. If I don't know you that well. If I know you haven't been a good father. I'm not going to wish you a happy Father's Day. That would be wicked. That would be ungodly. If you've left this woman or, or the grandparent of this child to be taken care of and you've been going about your business, or you've gone and broken laws that you didn't have to break, not trying to survive, and you're locked up in prison. I am not going to do it because I know what a true father is. And this 103rd Psalm is going to show us what a true father is. It's going to show us what we as men should strive to be like so that the women that we marry, when I say women, I don't mean I get more than one. I mean, this man gets one, this man gets one, this man gets one. Our wives, in singular for us, my wife, your wife, his wife, they can look to us and realize that they see God reflected in us. In a limited sense, this is what should be. So tonight, as we go through this word, I desire, one, to show you what the Father's like, number two, to remove the myths of fatherhood, Number three, to show you the benefit of having a father. What a father's like, remove the myths and encourage us to be the same kind of thing. Can we go into the passage? I know we can. Let's read through it one time and squeeze the juice out of it. This is a Psalm of David. I don't know exactly when it was written. It could have been written before he had his escapade with Bathsheba. Could have been written after he had his escapade with Bathsheba. Some feel that it was written after the exile. I'm going to go with the word of God that I have here, a Psalm of David. Listen to it as I read through it. Bless Yahweh, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless Yahweh, O my soul, and forget not his benefits. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities? Who healeth all thy diseases? Who redeemeth thy life from destruction? Who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies? Who satisfy thy mouth with good things? So that thy youth is renewed like an eagle's. Yahweh executeth righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. He made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. Yahweh is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord Yahweh pitieth them 
that fear him. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. As for man, his days are as grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourishes. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone. And the place thereof shall know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord, but the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting to them that fear him. I want to make this stop making noise. And righteousness unto the children of children. We're not going to have this. But, his, but the mercy of Yahweh is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him. And his righteousness unto the children's children. To such as keep his covenant. And those that remember his commandments to do them. The Lord Yahweh has prepared his throne in the heavens. And his kingdom ruleth over all. Bless the Lord, Yahweh, his angel, that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening to the voice of his word. Bless ye, Yahweh the Lord, all ye his hosts, ye ministers of his that do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless Yahweh, O my soul. Do you, do you see in this psalm here that David understands what it is to see his king eternal, immortal, invisible, that dwells in the light that's unapproachable, which no man has seen nor can see, who causes the storm to come, who causes the earth to quake, who freed them from the land of Egypt, who opened up the Red Sea, Reed Sea as some people call it, slapped it together and killed Pharaoh, brought the frogs, brought the plagues, brought the boils, opened the earth and swallowed Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. He sees the one that controls the mighty host, the ones that we call angels, watchers, cherubim, seraphim, principalities, powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. He sees that one as father. He sees his judge as father. He sees the holy one as father. And because of that, and think about the multitude of who he is and the greatness of who he is and all of that power that he possesses. That he, let me be David for a minute. He chose me. Me, 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 me. I, I, I was out there in the field with the sheep. When the prophet Samuel came to anoint one because God had a man that was anointed that was still anointed, but this man was rejected, whose name happened to be Saul. Yahweh chose me. He saw me. Did you hear what I just said? He saw me. My daddy thought not enough for me to bring me in the house when we were going to anoint a king, 1 Samuel 15. My mother didn't. My brothers didn't. Yahweh saw me. With all that power he possessed, he sees me as his son. He has even told me if it was written right before he died, that he even was going to select my son to be his son. And his son would be my Lord. Oh, that's, that's deeper than I'm going right now. But listen to what he said. Bless Baruch. Bless Speak highly of, speak in a way that's reverential, praises upon Yahweh. You have a capital L, capital O, capital R, D, which is Yudhe Vave. Some people will say Yahweh and some will say Yahuwah. 
Bless Yahweh, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Everything is in my being. Everything that I have, bless his holy name. His name is not to be taken in vain. His name is not to be put in the same sentence in so far as comparing them to be equal with him. What do you mean, Tim? I had a man yesterday that I was doing some work for, and his son was there. And he's in a different religion than I'm in. And, and I was asking him if he loved the word of God. And he said, yes, he, he loves, he, he believes in the most high. I said, which most high? I said, because your family, your father, as far as I know, is Muslim. He says, he's Allah. I said, I don't serve Allah. I don't even pretend. I serve Yudhe I serve El Elyon. And that's the one that I bless. And although we are different, I said, don't pretend with me. Let's be real. We serve different ones. And I am not going to make him equal. I said, your surah in your Quran, 112 says, Allah begets none. Allah has no son. There is none like him, but Yahweh has a son. Yahweh has many sons. <laughs> Yahweh is father. So he says, bless Yahweh, O oh my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless everything about his name. If you think about those first four commandments, you understand it's about blessing his name. I am Yahweh, your God that brought you up out of Egypt. I'm the one freed you. I'm the one established you. I'm the one that made you a nation. I'm the one that kicked Pharaoh and those gods of Egypt's rump. I did that. And I redeemed you. Brought you out of slavery. Brought you to myself. You're mine. And you saw my works. Have no other gods before me. Don't even make a graven image. Your mind is not strong enough. Your mind cannot encompass the, the totality of who I am. The vastness of my presence. Don't make a graven image. I'm holy. Don't take my name in vain. Don't swear upon my name. And don't fulfill it. Don't take an oath to my name and take it lightly so that you can manipulate someone, tell somebody you're a prophet, and you swear by your decree that they're healed when they're not, or you declare that they're going to get this, or that God has told this beautiful woman that she's going to be your wife. Don't swear I'm going to pay you back. I swear before God. Don't take my name in vain. I'm holy. And remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. This is what you're told. You are told to keep it holy. I would submit to you when you start looking at what we call the New Testament, we're supposed to serve him in the holiness and righteousness and we're supposed to do that before him all the days of our life. Luke 1, 73 through 75. So, he teaches you how to reverence me as father. How should you reverence your own father? Well, let's look and see what a father does, and then you'll see why David could reverence Yahweh as father. We can remove some of the myths that we have, and then we can understand more what it's like to see him as father. Bless Yahweh, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. That's what the Bible can tell you. In First Thessalonians, I believe it is 5 and 18, in everything give thanks. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. When you take his blessings and you act like you deserve them, just because you walk on this planet, just because you can look in the mirror and you can articulate sentences in such a way that it make people swoon, or you can sing and, and women go, that does not impress Yahweh. It says, forget not all his benefits. I want you to look. And I want you to see what a man did so that you can understand what he's saying. 
First of all, I've already told you the benefits of who he is. I've already told you who he is. But I want you to see somebody that forgot his benefits. And I want you to see what David is saying. Now, King Hezekiah, God had made Hezekiah king. God had blessed Hezekiah and the works of his hand. God had let this man that had lived to the place where you've lived a wonderful life. You've lived a glorious life. Now it's time to die. Hezekiah doesn't want to die. He turns his face to the wall. And obviously he cries to God and asks God, don't take me yet. And before the prophet Isaiah could get away, God sends him back and he grants to Hezekiah another 15 years. Well, in that 15 years, within that 15 years, he has another son. And that son he has name is Manasseh, one of the wickedest kings that ever lived. But listen to what 2 Chronicles 32 and 25 says. But Hezekiah rendered not again according to the benefit done to him, for his heart was lifted up. Therefore was wrath upon him and upon Judah and Jerusalem. Notwithstanding, Hezekiah humbled himself before the pride of his heart, both he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the wrath of Yahweh came not upon him, in the days of Hezekiah, they came afterwards. What I want you to understand, what David is saying is don't forget his benefits, Lord. Don't let me forget your benefits. Although I come before Hezekiah, there's a thing within the heart of man that when a man gets blessings from God, when God gives a man prosperity, when God let a man be good looking or let him have a fat wallet or let him have a wife that he enjoys or let him have children, let him have fame and fortune, often he forgets Yahweh. Why do you not say a woman? A woman does the same thing, but we're talking about fathers right now. And listen to what God has said before Hezekiah that David was able to look at and see what the blessed word of God say. In your Bibles, if you're willing to go in your Bibles, go to Deuteronomy 32, verse 6. Tell me why you go to the scriptures. Because the Bible is not just one book. The Bible is to get the word of God. We take the writings of Moses and the prophets repeat them and David repeats them and the further revelation, not revelation, but further information, yes, at that time, and revelation is given so that you can understand the complete whole of what he is saying. Listen to what Moses had said. Moses said in Deuteronomy chapter 32 and 6, giving the word of God to the people, thus, do you thus requite Yahweh? Oh, foolish people people and unwise is not thy father is not he thy father that bought thee has not he made thee and established thee remember the days of old consider the years of many generations as the father he will show thee the elders and they will tell thee when the most high El Elion divided the nations their inheritance. He separated the sons of Adam, or in, as the Dead Sea Scrolls say, the sons of God. Well, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the Beneha Elohim, the sons of God, or the angelic being. If you have a Septuagint version, you will see that in Deut Deuteronomy 32 and 8, it'll say the angels of God. The point is, Ask your father about his resume. I want you to see one more thing while you're in Deuteronomy. Go to Deuteronomy 8 and 13. It's important. You know what, Tim? What, Tim? Go ahead and read the 11th verse. Okay, I'll do that. Deuteronomy 8 and 11 says, Beware that thou forget not Yahweh thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes which I command thee this day, lest when thou and eaten and a fool, and have built goodly houses and dwelt therein. And when thou herds and thou flocks multiply, and thy silver and gold is multiplied, 
and all that thou hast is multiplied, then thy heart be lifted up and forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Forget not his benefits. His benefits is he took you, he made you, he established you, he's going to set you up on high, he's going to make you to leave because he wants the nation to learn his laws through you. And David is saying he set me up like he did those people in Deuteronomy. And he said, my soul, my soul, don't forget his benefits. Then he just goes on a little more and tells some of the magnificent things God did for them. But I want you to look at what he said. I'm going to read it because it's so important. It says, who led thee through the great and terrible wilderness, wherein with fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, where there was no water, who brought forth water out of the rock of Flint. His benefit are all the things that could have killed you. When you were thirsty, he gave you water. Forget not his benefits that he showed that he was your provider. As the old songs used to say, you make a way out of no way. He did that for you. Verse 16, who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee, that he might prove thee to do thee good in the latter end, to take you and prepare you so that when you went to battle, that no matter what happened, you would trust him. That's his benefit. Verse 17, and thou shalt say in thine heart, my power and my might have gotten me this wealth. But remember Yahweh thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant which he swear unto thy father as it is this day. And it shall be if thou do it all forget Yahweh thy God, and walk after other gods and serve them and worship them, I testify against you this day. You shall surely perish. And he goes on to let them know that's what happens to the other nations. But for those that say, Tim, you, all you did was gave me the Old Testament. You better wipe that out of your mind. The Bible says every word is God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. But thus saith the Lord in Luke chapter 17, verse 17. And Jesus answering, you see there were 10 lepers and he wanted to they wanted to be healed. And so he met him in the village. I could have started verse 12, but I'm just starting at 17. And they all were healed. And he says, go and let the priest, let the priest know that they can do for you what was needed to be done, the type of sacrifice that needed to be made and be declared clean. So listen to what it says. I'm going to go to 15 because I love you so much. Then I'll go back to 17. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving thanks. And he was a Samaritan, no doubt a half-breed, no doubt one of those people that didn't know what they were worshiping. If you read John chapter 4, you know that. He gave thanks. He was really redeemed from being dead. Being a leper was the same in the same category as being ceremonially dead and you were to be separated from all people. So now we're at 17 and 17. And Jesus answering said, we're not 10 cleansed, but where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said unto them, arise, go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. <laughs> Ten were cleansed. One was made whole. Go back to our text. Let's see if you can understand David. Bless the Lord, oh, oh my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless Yahweh, oh my soul, and forget not his benefits. When one forgets his benefits, you don't give him the praise that he deserves as God, and you're not treating him as the father that he is, the father that protects you, the father that provides for you, the father that makes sure that you grow up in the nurture and admonition that he has so that you can lead and have dominion in the world and so that you can teach others so that you can reflect his glory 
glory without having to guess at it. And this man turned and gave thanks. Then he says in verse 3, Who forgiveth all thine iniquities and healeth thy diseases? Who forgives your sins? Who heals your disease? Do you think it was the medicine? Do you think it was the herb? Do you think it was the Echinacea purpurea or the Echinacea augustifolia? Do you think it was the turmeric? What do you think that it was that healed you? Did you think it was the mud that was on the beach that you put on the side of the wall? Like I was told to dig it out when I was a kid and wrap it with some vinegar around my ankle? If God did not allow it to heal, it would not heal. But who forgives your lawlessness? When the children of Israel sinned against God, and God said that he would pardon, it was because Moses went to the Father and said to the Father, if you destroy them, the other nations will say you couldn't do it. And they will take your name and, and make it shame. Somebody said, Timmy didn't say it like that. Well, if you can read well, you'll understand that Moses was interested in the glory of God's name. Are you interested in your father's name? We'll give you a mental break right now. I did work for some people years ago, and these people are Indian, and they have a lot more than many people have, and they have a lot more than a lot of people have, and no, I'm not going to tell you their name, but he had a, the man had a son and a daughter, son, I mean, they drive Mercedes, and they drive Lexus, and all of this kind of stuff, I mean, a lot of stuff they got in. The young guy, he drive fast, get tickets, and just was wild. Loved rap music. And I had seen him for two or three years, and then there went a two or three year period where I didn't see him anymore. Now he was in charge of some of their businesses, and I'm doing some work for them. And I hear him tell somebody, when Mr. Merritt say this, do this. When Mr. Merritt say do this, you do this. When Mr. Merritt say this, whatever Mr. Merritt need, you do it. And when the other person was gone, I said to him, I want to just say, young man, to keep his name out of my mouth, young man, what happened? You used to, I remember you used to be out there. You used to be wild. What happened? He said, I got older. Listen to this. And I didn't want to do anything that would cause my father shame. I didn't want to do anything that would bring shame to my father. Tears came in my eyes. As I thought about Tim Merritt growing up, how much shame did I bring my father and my mother because I wanted to be accepted by people? Not that I just wanted to be a certain, I wanted to, I just wanted to fit in. It wasn't for me to fit in. And the same thing is happening in this world with political correctness. That's why somebody will say something right, and then if you get boycotted, they take it back. Or they won't say it because they'll lose their job, or they won't speak up for Yahweh. They want to be accepted. Here, when we look at this, who forgives your iniquity? Moses is saying, Lord, your name, the, the, your name, I care for your name. I don't want to do anything that will bring shame to my wife for marrying me or shame to my mother as I'm a grown man. I've already reached past the middle of my life. I don't even want to bring shame to those that listen to me teach. And he says, he forgives your iniquities, but I believe there's consequences. And there's a, there's a process of being forgiven. He heals all your diseases. Who redeemeth your life from destruction. This word destruction here, the word is sahat or sehat, which means the pit or the grave. And I want you to get a feel for this because sometimes he delivers your life from the grave and you don't die. But there's ultimate way that he delivers you from the grave. Now, remember, we've already gone all the way up to Psalm 103 going through this book. Yes, it's taken a long time, but it's worth it. 
I mean, what good are you going to church 30, 40 years and you can't even go through the book of Psalms? Uh, I'll stop right there. S Psalm 47, I'm sorry, Psalm 49, verse 7 says, and he's, this is the psalmist telling the truth about life and wealth. I'll do six because it seemed like a more complete thought. They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother nor give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of their soul is precious, and it ceases forever, that he should still live forever and not see corruption. For he seeth that wise men die, likewise the fool and the brutish person, and leave their wealth to others. Their inward thought is that their houses shall continue forever, and their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands after their own names. Nevertheless, man being in honor abideth not. He is like the beast that perish. They, this is their way, this is their folly, yet their prosperity or prosperity approve of their saying, Selah. Like sheep, they are laid in the grave. Death shall feed on them, and the upright shall have dominion over them in the morning, and their beauty shall consume in the grave and their dwelling. Listen to this. This is this is important. This is the Jews. This is the Jews. This is the Jews right here, okay? This is the Jews. Verse 15. But God will rede redeem my soul from the power of the grave. My father, my king, eternal, immortal, the one that is holy, the one that broke the Red Sea, opened and closed, the one that opened the earth in number 16 on Corinth, Dathan, and Abiram. He will redeem my soul from the grave. He will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me. This is the kind of father we're talking about. One that is always doing the best for his children so that they can have life, so that they can have dominion. The myth is just because you ejaculate or you get a woman pregnant by impregnating her with your sperm and it fertilizes the egg, that does not make you the kind of father that God is. God not only creates God cares for, he tends to, he protects, he helps grow, he gives benefits, and he also gives instructions which may hurt, but he does it for our good, that ultimately, that ultimately when he gives life, he gives life. Oh, bless the holy name of the Father, the Father that we serve, the God eternal immortal. Then he says, he redeemeth. Thy life from destruction the pit, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. None of us have done anything in our lives to make God extend that favor toward us. He did it of his own volition. He gives a covenant to man. He puts himself and he said, this is what I'll do. This is what I'll do to free you from the bondage of death and the bondage of sin. Come and take my yoke. I, I, I ain't just going to do it now. Come and take my yoke. Learn of me. He said to his son, I'm meek and lowly in heart. You'll find the rest of your soul. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Come and do. Come and enter into life with me and become my servant. And I'll benefit you. I'll crown you with loving kindness, with said loyal love and tender mercies compassion that you're going to need throughout this life. Notice verse 5. Who satisfy thy mouth with good things. The word here is really not mouth. The word here, is speaking of desire. The things that you long for. Who satisfy you with good things so that your youth is renewed like an eagle. I'm going to read a scripture to you then I'm going to explain something to you. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 30, many of you have heard this, these two verses before 30 and 31, but I want you to hear them now. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon Yahweh shall re 
knew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. But what I understand about an eagle is this. At a certain time, he'll pluck out all of his feathers and grow new ones and renew his strength. The psalmist is here is talking about how Yahweh will renew our strength. He's talking about how he will renew us. Oh, we're talking about as a father that takes his son and every day he's interested in that son, that daughter, and not only encouraging them in that love, but preparing them so that they'll know how to treat their children. Every day is a new day. It's a new blessing. It's a new opportunity for you to reverence your father. Would to God we as men Understand that the first institution that God ever made was the family. It was not the church. It was not the government. It was not your school. It was not city council. It was the family. The man, the wife, to make the children. The father already had some sons. Now he made sons of spirit and earth. And they were to replicate what he was doing on the earth. That's why he allows us, in a minimalistic way, to create life. We don't do it apart from him. We do it with him. Yet, we are part of what takes place. He satisfies you with good things so that your youth is renewed. That's why he gave him manna. It says, Yahweh executed the righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. Righteousness and judgment is the thing that we look for. If all of us received righteousness and judgment when we were oppressed, if all of our ancestors had received righteousness and judgment, if all of them, then their children would have benefited. I don't care if we're talking about the Hebrew people over here. I'm not, I don't care if we're talking about the people that are called any of them. Many of them were black too. There are some white people and people of other nationalities that have been oppressed. But when Yahweh God executes righteousness and judgment, he's doing the job of a father. A father, a young girl should not grow up because a daddy or a man, he got horny. Well, he got horny. I'm going to say it because you all know what it, is, what it is. And if you don't, you can't be offended. He got sexually excited when got this woman impregnated her. She, she has a daughter and you do nothing for her. You don't protect her from the evil. You don't protect her from the schools. You don't protect her from the boys. You don't protect her from the girls. You don't protect her from the men or the women or from bullies or from hunger or from sickness. You don't protect. How can somebody say you're walking like a father? Yahweh has proven himself to be the great father. And is an example for us all. Yahweh is father, not just God. Notice what he says. He executes righteousness. Sometimes in the old home, fathers will not execute righteousness. Yaakov, Jacob didn't. He allowed Differences to be shown between his children. And he says he gives judgment for all that are oppressed. Men, that's our job. Most of the time, the women are doing it. We got to come back to where God is. If we look at our Father, our Heavenly Father, then we can learn how to be fathers in this world and in this home. Now, there are some people that you should be a father to in this world. And I don't mean being a father trying to lay up and have sex with them like many ministers do. I'm talking about being a father like the Yahweh is to us. Then it says, He made his ways known to Moses and his acts to the children of man. He gave his ways, his instruction to Moses then he acted in the midst of the sons of men to show that he is active, that he's in their lives. Listen to me. That's why Deuteronomy chapter 6, Deuteronomy chapter 11, tells the fathers, train your sons when they rise up, 
when they sit down, when they go by the way, you're supposed to teach his ways, his statutes to your sons. You're supposed to teach it because your sons will beget sons and daughters. Your daughters should be able to hear this from you so that they know what kind of man that they should marry. They shouldn't just marry somebody because they think he's cute or because he got a, a what they call a moose knuckle and she liked the way that looked. Or because he looked good in his shorts. Or because he got a new car. She should be able to look and see him. Somebody that acts like the father God that I know. My wife told me one time. She said, Tim, before I married you, God was my husband. I had gotten to the place where God was my husband. I didn't need nobody else. And if he couldn't give me somebody that would be like him, I didn't want it. This is the job. Do you know that the father did that for her because there was nobody else around doing it for her? She was just reading his word. I'm here to tell you today, he made his ways known to Moses and his acts to the children of Israel to show his judgment, his justice, his provision, his care, and that he would keep his word and nothing was too big for him. Listen to verse 8. Yahweh is merciful and gracious. Do you understand he didn't have to be merciful? I can go and read, I am going to read at least one verse. This is 34th chapter of Exodus, verse 6. I want you to hear when they had done the ultimate slap in the face to the Heavenly Father. They went made a golden calf and attributed his name to a golden calf like the calves they worship in Egypt. And God was getting ready to kill them. So Moses had asked God to show him his glory. Because that was in 32, I'm in 34, verse 6 now. And it says, and the Lord passed before him, because he wanted to see him. Yahweh passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, Yahweh, God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, and abundance in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and will by no means clear the guilty visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. The point that I want to pull from this is this. Merciful and gracious, the Lord, Yahweh, Yahweh, God, merciful and gracious, long suffering. I heard it, I heard it explained by Dr. Moorcraft, and I've seen it before in some of the reformers' writings. Long suffering really does deal with God's ability to hold God back from executing this judgment on you when you need it. In other words, there's nobody stronger than me. Let me give you a better illustration. When God wants to swear, you'll see it in Hebrews chapter 6. You'll also see it in the 15th chapter of the book of Genesis. When God swears, <laughs> guess who he swears by? He, there's no one greater than him, so he swears by himself. When mankind is wicked and ungodly, and the wrath of God is going to come upon him, and here comes the wrath of God coming down. The only thing that holds his wrath back is God's strength, and he holds it for a while. That's long suffering. You deserve it, but I'm pitying you. I'm treating you as a father. I submit to you, fathers, when your children are wrong, do you have any long suffering? Do you just automatically just beat them down like a dog? Do you not have any compassion? Do you not understand that your father shows you compassion when you need it? Do you ever have compassion for your wife in your home? Do you just go in and bully people because you're bigger than them? I'll tell you the truth. There are some women that will slip a blade inside of you. There are some that will give you something to drink. And I won't mention it because somebody might use it. But I'm telling you, it says in this passage, he's merciful and gracious, slow to anger, plenteous in mercy. This is why we take him for granted so many times. He will not always chat or dispute with you. He will not keep his anger forever. He knows how to forgive. I remember when I was taking care of my niece, and I realized that you're going to have to do this the way God does you. How do you act when you want? Do you want God to get you every time? Because I have spoken my word and you defied me. 
and I learned how to forgive, let some things go, let some things be punishment. I learned because I realized I have someone watching me. David says, Lord, don't let me forget your benefits. I'm looking at how you do things. You are a father. You remove the myth that just being a father is because you can impregnate a woman. You remove that myth and you show how it is to be done. And notice what he says here. This is very beautiful. Verse 10. He has not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. You think that he has done everything that he should do to us based upon how we have defied him or went against him and how we have made him jealous, how we can spend more time watching Netflix, how we can spend more time going to the movies, how we can spend more time watching sports than we do paying attention to his words, how we can be more kind and friendly to everybody else and in our own home, how we can do everything that we want to do and give him the last of the list. He's not like Whitney Houston saying, though I try to resist being last on your list, he's not going to be last. But he says, he's not reward us according to our sins. If we saw how great God was, we treat him differently. Nor is he rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. You see, Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is to depart from iniquity. There's a qualifier there. Don't go telling everybody that's living in wickedness and ungodliness and thumb their nose up or shoot their middle finger up in the air to God in his word and tell them God's mercy is everlasting because his mercy can still be everlasting, but they are not a possessor of his mercy. His mercy, listen, let's read it slowly, okay? Let's read it as if we're just learning how to read, okay? For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. It's qualified those that fear him, and you can only fear him if you know him. Same thing with a father. When a father knows how to execute righteous judgment, when a father knows how to do mercy, when a father provides, he deserves fear. He deserves respect. He's in the place of God. Now, somebody say, what about the mother? Same thing. When I'm dealing with a passage and talking more about the mother, I will. But I'm going to bring this in right now. The mother deserves the same amount of respect as the father, but the father owes that mother. He owes that wife. And if you went out here and made a child by somebody that you're not not married to, you still owe that woman respect, and you still are supposed to be doing for that child if you call yourself a child of God, the living God who is blessed forever. Amen. You don't like me saying it? I say, thus saith the Lord. Next verse. As far as from the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. How does he do that? How did he move our sins away like that? Well, can we take what is called a New Testament scripture and look and see how it is done? I think it'll be, I think it'll be apropos. Let's go to Hebrews 12 and 5. Because if you just read it like that, you think you just move our sins away and we can just do like we want to. We go zippity doo da, zippity yay. My, 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 my sins are all washed away. No, it don't work like that. Hebrews 12 and 5. Listen to what the writer tells these Hebrew brethren. And have you forgotten the exhortation we speak it's Unto you as children, my son, despise thou not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him for whom the Lord loveth. He chasteneth and scourges. That's scourging. That's scourging. That's scourging every son whom he receiveth. Every son. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as sons. But what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? See, if you're a real father, your job is to chasten, but you still have their loving kindness and mercy. But you should know the ways of God like Moses knew the ways of God that teach Israel his firstborn son, according to Exodus 4 and 22 through 24. And so he says, if you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons? And God refuses to have bastards. 
I say God refuses to have bastards. I'm going to chasten my sons. Don't go listen to a preacher saying God ain't mad at you. The father does get mad at the children. The father does get angry with his children because I've given you all that you need. I've protected you. I've given you strength. I've led you in the way that's right and you want to rebel against me as if you know more than I do. Don't play with me like that. I'm king eternal. Don't ever forget just because I'm your father. I still have the role of judge. I still have the role of king. I still have the role, role, role of God of all the earth. Get your mind right when you deal with me. Verse 9. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we much not rather, or shall we not much rather be in subjection to the Father of Spirit to live? For they verily chasing us for a few days after their own pleasure. But he, listen, for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. This is, the, this is fatherhood. When you chasten your son, it's so that he can partake of the benefit of God's holiness, not yours. If your name is Mr. XYZ, you chasten your son so that he can be a partaker of the benefit of Yahweh, not XYZ, of the father. Because if he benefits from the Father, he'll get yours. But the most important blessing you can give to your son is that you treat him as the Father treated you. Yahweh is the Father to them that fear him. Was I clear? Yes, I was. Verse 11. No chastening, for the present seemed joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, it afterward yields us a peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them that are exercised thereby. This is how the Father does it. So verse 12, back in our text, 103 and 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us, how did he do it? He drove it away. He drives it away in his chastisement. He drives it away in his instruction. He drives it away in loving kindness. He drives it away in judgment. But he always, he always has the proper balance so that you will be able to reflect him in the land. Listen to this one. As a father pities his children, so Yahweh pity of them that fear him. Again, qualified. If you're arrogant, you don't fear him, that's not the same as fearing him. So he says, like as a father pities his children, so pitieth, he pitieth them that fear him. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14, he teaches the assembly, Paul does, to look out for people like that. Where you get that from, Tim? Well, I'll read it. Paul tells the people in Thessalonica, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly. Comfort the feeble-minded. Support the weak. That's morally weak and be patient toward all men. The point that I'm talking about, comfort the feeble-minded. Everybody don't have the right mindset. Some people are not as strong mentally as others. You comfort those, warn them that are unruly, support the weak. How do you support them? How does God support you when you don't have your mind right? You support them by giving them the sweet word of God. But I want you to look at something that I left out just a moment ago when I was in Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 12, listen to what it says here. It's very important for you to see verse 12 of Hebrews 5. It says, wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame. Let's see here these terms like weaknesses, like sicknesses, like uh, somebody's out of kilter. Look at this. Wherefore, lift up the hands that hang down, you're discouraged, and the feeble knees, you're wobbly, and make path, straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but rather let it be healed. All this comes on the heel of chastening. He pities us. He knows our frame is dust. He pities us in the chest. Time it is to actually heal us. Good God Almighty. And he says, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man shall fail the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. And thereby be defiled. And he'll go through and tell you, be a, you could end up being a fornicator because you don't appreciate what he's done. 
read it, Tim. You know, some people don't read the Bible. If you don't read it, they're not going to go back and read it. Okay. Verse 15. Looking diligently, lest any fail the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person, as he saw, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. You know, sometimes you just want this one time. I just want to do this one more time. I just want to get him. I just want to hurt her. I just want to steal it. I just won. It was just one time with him. For well, you know that how afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected and he found no place for repentance. Though he saw it carefully with tears, the chastisement of God is to keep you from being arrogant. The chastisement of God is to keep you from losing out on what you would have. The chastisement of God is for him to treat you as a son so that you can benefit in his holiness. So that you can understand what he has done. That you can understand as a father pities his children. The right kind of father. Yahweh does that. He knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are as grass and as the flower of the field. You're not going to live here forever. You're not going to live in this body forever. Look at people that were grown when you were a kid and look at what they look like now. They don't look the same. And if you've already lived over 30 or 40 years, look in the mirror. You still might be good looking at all of that. But I guarantee you, you're not the same. And the Bible says it. It says that the flower of the field, he flourishes. And the wind whoo, passes over and it is gone. And the place thereof shall know it no more. When I go to my mom's house, the place where I used to see my daddy sit, the place where I would sit, or the places where I would sit at the table, he is there no more. And there'll be one day I won't be here anymore. That's what the Bible says. If I want to be with the Father, I need him to deliver me from a destruction from the pit. I need to understand as a father, he's always a father. Trying to put me in the position of life. Trying to help me be the father to those that I'm supposed to be the father to. And no doubt if you're a woman, to be the mother. Because the role is parenting. I'm just using the term father here because this is what David is saying in this particular passage. Then look at what he says. But the mercy of Yahweh is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him. If you ever departed from iniquity, you don't fear him. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and depart from iniquity is understanding. If you don't fear Yahweh, you've got the wrong teacher. You spend wasting too much time doing church instead of doing the word of God. And this says it's from everlasting to everlasting to them that fear him. Why is that? Not that you can play because I'll keep chastening you as long as you have the heart to turn and be right with me. And this says in his righteousness unto children's children. His righteousness is from children to children because you model what the father does to you. You take seriously what he says. You fathers and you mothers really deals a lot with the law and instruction of a mother in Proverbs. You're teaching these children. You're bringing them up. You're teaching them who I am. You're teaching them what it is to follow me, and you're doing it my way. And your children are able to do their children and their children, and you have a legacy in this earth. And then he says, to such as keep his covenant, and those that remember his commandments to do them. Didn't the Bible say, 1 John 5 and 3, and this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. His commandments are not grievous. Then he says, Yahweh has prepared his throne in the heaven and his kingdom rules over all. This is the kind of father we have. He rules over all. And so he says, bless Yahweh, ye his angels, his malak. He has two kinds of malak. He has heavenly angels. He has earthly angels. Remember, Angels are, angel is a term messenger. It's a function. It's not the being. He has heavenly beings that are in the function of messengers. They are angels. You have earthly beings that are, in, that are messengers, and you'll have prophets, etc. Those are Malak. Those are messengers as well. And it says, but bless the Lord, ye his angels that excel in strength. 
Now let's look at the heavenly. That do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. Do you know if they got to listen? Do you know that they get judged? How much more we? We don't excel in spirit and strength like they do. And he says, bless Yahweh, all his host, all his army. Ye ministers of his that do his pleasure. Do you do his pleasure? Or do you do your pleasure? Bless Yahweh. All his armies, the heavenly army, the earthly army, you ministers that do his pleasure, whatever it is. If you had to fight Goliath, you're doing his pleasure. If you had to fight against the Philistines, you're doing his pleasure. If you had to help raise somebody up like Elijah and Elisha did, you are doing his pleasure. If you had to go fight against the armies of Beth Shekha, when he sent the anger of the Lord and he destroyed, when he sent the anger of the Lord to destroy those in Egypt that night, you're doing his pleasure. Bless Yahweh, all his works. Bless Yahweh, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless Yahweh, O oh my soul. As a father, your sons should see that your instruction come from heaven. Your, your sons should know that you are doing just like what the angels do. You are doing just like the people of old that conquered cities did. You should let them know that I do his commandments because he's father, because he's God, because he's worthy. And we do his pleasure because that's what he likes. And he crowns us. He satisfies our desires or our mouths with good things. We replicate him. And that way we know how to live, how to function, and how to establish the first institution. And he set up the family then it'd be easy for us to see how to do things in the assembly. And he ends with this. Baruch, bless Yahweh, all his works. Those things that we know that aren't intimate to us, bless him. Trees, bless him. Waters, bless him. Plants, bless him. Wind, bless all his works. Things that he's done for you, bless him. In all places of his dominion. That means everything. That's why you can read the Bible and everything to help praise you the Lord. In all his all places of his dominion. Bless Yahweh, O oh my soul. Yahweh, his father. He removed the myths that being father is just somebody that impregnates somebody. You set the example that you teach your children. You provide for your children. You instruct and correct your children so that they can have children and teach children that they can exercise dominion in their home and that they can spread your will. This is what we want. This is what I want you to take away from this passage. Merciful Savior who came to this earth and took on humanity to model God's ways to us to show us what it meant to bless the Father, to show us what it meant, the real chastisement when you took it for us and became sin for us. You knew no sin. You had no guile in your mouth. But you made an example for us. Help us to be an example, not only to the people that we're around, but to our children. So when people do say something like Father's Day, that it's just something that our children always, always remember that they can bless us and that they can call on our name as being holy. And we can look at our sons grow up and our daughters and we can bless their name because they bless your name. Amen. Amen. And even so, amen. I'll now open our class for discussion. If there's any discussion to be had tonight, I don't know if there's any discussion. <clears throat>